So hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. Yes, it is. Matthew 3, 2, among others. The kingdom of God has come upon you, Jesus said. Luke chapter 11, and other places. The kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 21, Jesus said. And the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power, Paul said. It was in 1 Corinthians 4.20. We want to have power-filled prayers going in both directions. What we hear from God, because I'll tell you, his word has power. His word never goes forth without accomplishing his purpose, it says in Isaiah 55. But listen to what God said. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let it start on earth where you are. You want power-filled prayers? Let it start right where you are. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says this. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. To serve him. And Paul, in the New Testament, in Romans 12, too, says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. Our prayers must not be about our will. It's about God's kingdom and his will. Stop. It says, you know, Paul said, let a man examine himself. Is our prayer life about going in and saying, God, here's what I want? We tell him what we want and how he should accomplish it. We're talking about our will, what we will. And so many people have dead prayers, prayers that just don't seem to accomplish anything. Although it says the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What makes a prayer effective? Well, I'm going to tell you since you asked. In 1 John 5, 14, I'm going to read 14 and 15. Here's what John wrote. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. You have a confidence when you're praying in God's will that it'll be done. That's right. The problem is the reason that so many prayers aren't being answered is because they're not in God's will. You can the prayers of the righteous. Paul was a righteous man. Hallelujah. Believe that. But I can think of a time when he was praying a prayer. He was passionately praying this prayer. Believe that. And his prayer was, take this from me, Lord God, this thorn in the flesh that was, that was picking at him, picking at him, picking at him. And there was no answer. Paul, what was Paul saying? Why aren't you answering my prayer, God? So he prayed again. And he said, Lord, take this from me. It wasn't, it wasn't a very effective prayer. But God, in his mighty love, the next time Paul prayed that prayer, the third time Paul prayed that prayer, and said, Father, take this thorn from me. God finally answered, hallelujah. And he said, no. My grace is sufficient. Amen. God's grace. You see, Paul was praying something outside of God's will. But God, in his amazing grace said to Paul that my amazing grace, that grace, is sufficient for you, Paul. God is a God of blessing. God is a God of love. He, was, he is a loving Father. He wants. You see, don't think he's to, if he's not answering your prayer that he's trying to deprive you of something. He said, I can't. You might have life and have it abundantly. He's not trying to keep anything from you. He's trying to give to you, but he's trying to give the things to you that will bless you indeed. It's the truth. You know, I, I always think of the, the time a, a man, a rich young ruler, came to Jesus and said he wanted to follow Jesus, right? Yes. You, know, you know, I'm sure you know the account. And when Jesus told him, okay, go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the man said he, he couldn't do that. He couldn't, he couldn't do that because those riches were so important to him. Was Jesus trying to deprive him of something? No, you know, that account starts with Jesus saying to the man, one thing do you yet lack. 
Jesus was trying to give to him. Jesus was trying to give to him the thing that he didn't have, the thing that his riches had not provided. Because with all of his riches, he was unsettled, he was unhappy, he was dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? That's true. That's why he came to Jesus. The one thing that Jesus could give him was life and life abundantly. He was trying to give to that man what that man didn't have, not to take from him what he did have. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you. He wants to give you life and life abundantly. But remember, he said, even when a man has abundance, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. It's not about stuff. It is about our relationship with our God. Changing, ageless one, you